This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics that impact you, the viewer. Today, our guest is Michael Kugelman. He is the Asia Program Deputy Director and Senior Associate at the Woodrow Wilson Center based in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Michael, for coming to our show and welcome to our show. Thank you. Good to be here with you as always. Yes. Michael, uh, tell me a little bit of what got you interested in South Asia program and the region as such. You are only, uh, I would say, a handful of South Asian specialists in, your, in, in this country. Tell us a little bit about it. No, you're right. Uh, there are very few of us. There are many more people that study China and the Middle East. Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, Frank, uh, it would be inaccurate for me to say that I had a lifelong dream to become a, a South Asianist. Uh, and what happened is um, I went to graduate school. I went to the Fletcher School at Tufts University, thinking that I was going to study the Middle East, um, because this was uh, just after the 9-11 attacks, just after the war in Iraq began. These are seminal moments that had close uh, linkages to the Middle East. I went to graduate school, but I took a class uh, my very first semester. And the class, fo I took the class on a whim and the class focused on South Asia. And at that point I was hooked. I said, gee, this is, this is a really interesting part of the world that I like to learn a lot more about. So I did a course correction early on in graduate school. So that's when I decided that I wanted to study South Asia. And then after you graduated, you, came, you went where? And then before you came to the Woodrow Wilson Center? Well, actually, the Wilson Center was where I went directly after graduate oh, okay. school. So, it, oh, and it's okay. been it's been almost fifteen years. Now you'll know. Now, oh. now your audience will know approximately how old I am, I guess. But uh, yeah, that's about fifteen okay. years well, yes. grad school. That's <laughs> a wonderful. Uh, thank you for being there. I have an enormous respect for you and for the Woodrow Wilson Center, where I, I am the member of the cabinet. Uh, uh, let me talk to you a little bit about Michael. Uh, how do you see the geopolitical implications? of this uh, virus, which is a global crisis, also known as COVID-19. Also, according to Trump, is also known as Wuhan, a Chinese virus. And the US interest in Asia and Indo-Pacific region, do you see a vastly different world emerging from it in the months and years to come? As you know, this will test our patience, our will, and our wisdom. And do you also think that Trump is can rise to meet this challenge well yeah a lot, lot of great questions there frank uh, i cannot overstate the impact that the covid 19 pandemic will have on the world and on the world order uh you know i think for for so long my generation had seen the 9 11 attacks as as a seminal moment as as the 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 one incident that had such a consequential impact on how the world uh, was and how it changed. But I would argue that the uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, has had a bigger impact, or will have an imp better, a bigger impact on world order um, than anything else since the, the end of the Cold War, just because, uh, you know, not just the global politics and the international economics, but also the way that societies interact, I think, will change a lot after this pandemic. And in terms of what it could mean, um, uh, for the world, I think that uh, so many countries will have shattered economies and will need to turn inward and focus on repairing those economies. I think that the economic struggles that could ensue could have impacts politically in the sense that uh, it could empower populist nationalists that um, are, could be uh, very anti-democratic and that could in turn exacerbate some of the democratic backsliding that we've already seen, certainly in Asia and South Asia. Uh, and the world on the whole. But I think that, you know, notions of power politics, uh, high politics, that will take a back seat. I, I think that so many countries around the world, including our own, the United States, will be focused on uh, redirecting attention inward to try to repair economies and go from there. Now, in terms of what, how President Trump, you know, I think that um, one could argue that he was very late, uh, and he's not alone, many leaders were late. He was very late in understanding and recognizing the scope of the coronavirus threat. Um, and he, he's responded too late. Um, now that he is responding, I think that's a good thing. He's got a very impressive, corona, well, several different coronavirus uh, committees that are trying to lead responses. He's got some of the top uh, medical experts in the world working directly for him, like Dr. Fauci. But um, mm -hmm. 
you know, what you need above everything else is coordination at the top and you need a clear strategy. And unfortunately, I still don't think there is a single clear cut strategy from the administration on how to move forward. Very well said. Uh, let me turn our attention uh, to the status of U.S.-India relationship after the Trump's visit to India. What did Trump and Modi accomplish with this trip to date? No trade deal has been signed. None seem to be in the future. As you probably know, at least to my understanding, the Trump's visit was uh, more symbolism than substance. I would also argue that uh, his visit directly benefited Trump with the Indian American community. And, and he has gained a lot of popularity among the Indian American, and they potentially are the people who could contribute to his campaign. But unfortunately, 87% of the Indian Americans are Democrats, they're not a Republican. And so do you think the visit was aimed to get vote from India diaspora? It was more than that. So I do think that Trump's visit to India uh, delivered a major boost to the UN, to the U.S.-India relationship. I think it's very significant that um, a president who is notoriously averse to long-distance travel made the very long trip to India um, uh, at a time when he knew that there was not going to be any type of major deal. And he's all about deals. He knew that this long negotiated uh, trade agreement was not going to be finalized in, term, in time for his visit. So the fact that he still went to India, I think that that sort of in of itself is, is a victory and a good thing for the relationship. Um, uh, I think that the speech that he gave in Gujarat, which was to a huge crowd of, of Indians, what, 80, 90,000, whatever the number is, uh, it like was very that, well right? received. Something like that, yeah. It was very well received because he, uh, his speechwriters had done their homework. Uh, they had actually um, conveyed a sense that President Trump understood the political and cultural history of India. Uh, I think that's, and it was well received. And then he had meetings with Prime Minister Modi in New Delhi that uh, yielded a very uh, expansive joint statement that outlined a lot of areas of potential cooperation. Um, and, but to your question about the domestic political factor for Trump, Absolutely. You know, I said before, it's it's impressive that someone that doesn't like to travel long distances went so far away to spend time in India. Trump knew. Trump would not have made the trip, Frank, in my view, if there was not going to be that big rally that he gave in Gujarat, because President Trump wanted to be able to go to India, give a speech to 80, 90,000 screaming Indians, come back to the U.S. and tell the Indian American community Look, I went to India and spoke before 100,000, 120,000 uh, Indians screaming my name because Trump knows, as you noted, that the Indian American community tends to vote Democrat. It's interesting. The Indian, Com Indian American community is very supportive of Modi in many ways, but it's not all that supportive of, of Trump. Uh, and Trump is trying to change that. So I think he did want to use, he wanted to derive a domestic political benefit for himself out of this trip uh, to India. But I think that the, his trip to India puts the U.S.-India position in a, good, in, a, in a strong position to really take off the joint statement that came out after his meeting with Modi, outlined a huge a number of areas to, to cooperate in. And I would highlight energy in particular. We talk about security yeah. Yeah. being the main element of the relationship, but energy, you know, there were two energy deals uh, during Trump's trip. Uh, they weren't major right. deals, but they were deals. And you know, U.S. U.S. energy exports to India have gone up significantly over the last few years. There's a strategic energy partnership, so I think that's one area that could really see a lot of growth in this relationship. So, as you know, uh, we have uh, we're going to have election in November. We could potentially have a new president, and that could be Democrat, that could be Biden. How do you see the trajectory of India-U.S. relationship under a Biden presidency? Do you think the Modi's tilt with the Republican Party be an obstacle to ties under a Democratic presidency? Do you think Joe Biden will be better for U.S.-India relationship? And he'll promote the Obama's vision of defining partnership with the 21st century between India and the United States. You know, Trump stayed silent uh, on the religious prosecution, on the talks about the human rights violations, and also freedom of press, freedom of expressions, and the Citizenship Amendment Bill. Do you think 
uh, that Biden will speak up, speak out against uh, those pop issues because they are central to a vital and vibrant democracy that we believe strongly. Our constitution calls for religious freedom. So I think that um, a President Biden would um, not have any type of notable, it would not lead to any notable changes in the U.S.-India relationship. I think he would enjoy a level of continuity with what it's had during the Trump years and the Obama years and the George W. Bush years for that matter, which has been a focus on right. moving the relationship forward in a big way. And I think that we've heard uh, in recent months that the U.S.-India relationship is becoming increasingly partisan in the, in the United States given that it has been liberal and progressive Democrats, particularly on Capitol Hill, that have been most vocal about India's domestic policies along the lines of what you suggested, India's policies in Kashmir, the new citizenship law, which is very controversial, uh, but it has been these progressive Democrats. So if we, had, if we well, were to but, have had- But, but I, wanna, I wanna kind of comment on it. The, the bill, the, the resolution that was uh, not passed because they didn't bring it to the House, uh, that that was also high sponsorship from the Republican as well. It did. You're right. There was a, a, very, a fairly small number of Republicans and many more Democrats, as I recall. It was bipartisan, but not 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 in terms of numbers. At any rate, right. had there been, if we were going to be talking about a President uh, Sanders um, uh, yes. in in the White House, then I think the relationship perhaps could change in this. And we know this is not going to happen just because Bernie Sanders has been very critical of India. Uh, but Joe Biden is not in that same category. Uh, he is what I would describe as a, as a democratic centrist. Uh, I don't do not think he would be as fixated on the human rights issues as some of these more liberal Democrats. Now, that does not mean that Biden would not push back against India more so than Trump has. I'm sure he would. I mean, we remember that Biden served with Barack Obama. Barack Obama, when he was president, went to India, his last visit to India as president, and he made a speech in which he actually gently, but nonetheless significantly, pushed back and critiqued India for concerns about religious freedom. I was there. So I, could, I was there. You were, I'm sure you were. Yeah, it was a great speech. Him, yeah. uh, so I'm sure that, that Biden would not exactly hold back because Biden is not the type to, to hold back. But I think compared to other Democrats, more liberal Democrats, um, you, you wouldn't see that type of pushback from, from Biden. Um, but, you know, if, if we were to have both chambers of Congress, both House and Senate become Democratic controlled, that could provide more space for Democrats of all types to be critical of India. So that could have an impact. But to get the answer to your question is I really don't think the U.S.-India relationship will change under Biden. I think it would remain strong and consistent. Um, but as to the issue of Modi appearing to, to favor the candidate Trump, Indeed, I think he is doing that. He is, Modi essentially endorsed Trump when he appeared at the Howdy Modi uh, rally in Houston. Excellent. I think that's just not a very good idea at all. Um, but uh, <laughs> well, it could make Modi illegal. look bad. It's illegal one one for the foreign, best, indeed. <laughs> it's, it's not a legal thing to do for a foreign uh, leader to endorse a political candidate in the United States. Exactly. Uh, so it was not it, a good move. I think you said, it, uh, you said it very well in terms of the... Uh, uh, I think it will stay because we have a, a shared interest and shared value between the United States and America. And I think that, I think, uh, and, and Biden will do the consensus build, building to make sure that he can advance the agenda, make sure he can sign the trade, make sure that they both uh, uh, can work together for shared goals um, as well. Let me uh, mm -hmm. talk to you a little bit about Afghan and peace process. How do you see Af Afghanistan's future? in the AFPAC region. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uncertainty. Do you think the Taliban will end their violence? And what will be required to bring to a meaningful and positive conclusion? And what role did Pakistan play in this peace process? Yeah, so it's a very complicated state of affairs in Afghanistan. As you know, there is an agreement between the US and the Taliban that calls for a phased US troop withdrawal if the Taliban fulfills the commitments in the agreement, and there aren't that many commitments. Mainly the, the agreement expects the Taliban to uh, deny space to international terrorists in Afghanistan, such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Um, but what, what the deal was really meant to do was pave the way for formal peace talks between the Taliban uh, and the Afghan government and other Afghan stakeholders uh, leading to a political settlement. And it's that element 
that has not begun yet. And I think there's reason to be concerned. There's been a longstanding spat between President Ghani and his main rival, Abdullah Abdullah. So long as they have that spat, it's going to be difficult to move forward in peace talks. And I think that the question becomes, uh, you know, the, the deal between the U.S. and the Taliban um, said that uh, U.S. troops would be, would, could, would, complete their withdrawal within 14 months, assuming that the Taliban has begun uh, talks with the, uh, with the Afghan government. The deal does not require there to be a peace deal uh, before the U.S. departs. So I think the question is, and it's quite likely, that we could have a situation where you have most, if not all, U.S. troops out of Afghanistan before there is actually a peace deal. And I think that could be very dangerous for Afghanistan. I think the Taliban would have much less incentive to try to negotiate a peace deal with, with the Afghan government. If it knows that all U.S. troops are leaving, why wouldn't it just want to return to the battlefield and try to overthrow the government by force? And at the end of the day, the big question is, does the Taliban, is the Taliban truly interested in negotiating a political settlement that would lead to a power sharing deal in which the Taliban would be operating within the very political system that it has long rejected and vowed to overthrow by force? Uh, so, so to me, that's, that's the big question. And Pakistan, of course, is very close to the Taliban. Pakistan helped bring the Taliban to the, to the table to have talks with the United States. Um, Pakistan claims that it supports anything that could bring about a peace deal in Afghanistan. But, you know, Pakistan is not, is, is not a magician. Uh, if the Taliban is not genuinely interested in negotiating uh, a peace deal, then it's not going to, no matter what Pakistan may try to do. So I am skeptical. I'm, I'm concerned. Bottom line is if the, uh, if the U.S. pulls out of Afghanistan without a peace deal, uh, Trump's critics will basically accuse him of surrendering, and that would not play well for him, especially with the election coming up. I'm not sure that he will do that now, but that's my personal uh, my observation. He probably will wait till the election is over, because that will be a very controversial thing to do. Right. right. And, of, and of course, the, the, yes, you're right. And the actual deal between the U.S. and the Taliban says that all troops shouldn't be out uh, until 14 months after the deal is signed. So that's not it's until a phase, what? It's a phase pull out. It's a phase pull out. Exactly. Yeah. So we're looking at April yeah. or May of 2021. So that means it would be the and next president then, that will make that decision. By then you could have a new, new president. Who knows? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It could be a President Biden that has to make that call on whether to pull all troops. Correct. Correct. I wanted to talk about the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. As you know, the Pakistan is indispensable to U.S. interests as an ally in furthering Americans' interests. Will the U.S.-Pakistan relationship come in the way of development of U.S.-India relationship to some extent? Also, how do you see U.S.-Pakistan relationship under the Biden presidency? So it's a good question. Uh, I mean, recent decades, the U.S. tends to look at its relationship with Pakistan through the lens of Afghanistan. And so the, the relationship's highs and lows are tied to what's going on in Afghanistan. And when the U.S. has thought that Pakistan is hindering the U.S. war effort in Afghanistan, such as by providing support to the terrorists that attack U.S. troops, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship suffers. When the U.S. thinks Pakistan is being helpful by helping facilitate talks with the Taliban, then the relationship is in a good place. And that is why the U.S.-Pakistan relationship is in a good place right now. So the question is, if we look to the ahead to a post-America Afghanistan, which is a matter of when, not if, I think the question is, what happens to the relationship at that point? And I think that the U.S.-Pakistan relationship will need a new anchor. It will need a new basis once U.S. troops begin leaving. And I think the question is, whatever president is in power at that point, whether it's Trump or Biden or whoever else, if they would be willing to look at Pakistan and see it as a country with strategic importance for reasons in of itself that have nothing to do with Afghanistan. Because if not, if the conclusion is that Pakistan is not worth dealing with, if the U.S. no longer has a presence in Afghanistan, then I think you could st see the relationship start to, uh, to uh, not, not to completely fall apart, but to become a much uh, a weaker relationship. And I think that'll be the case. I think there's sort of a bipartisan consensus uh, in Washington when it comes to Pakistan that, you know, th there's, there's certainly an interest in seeing it succeed or at least not fall apart, but there's not really a strong interest in pursuing that relationship in a big way once the U.S. has left Afghanistan. So whether we have Trump still in power or whether we have Biden taking office, I, I think that that position will be similar. Okay. Uh, before we lead our conversation, I want you uh, to tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the uh, 
What other South Asian countries that are vital to U.S. interests besides India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan? And this administration seems to not have paid any attention to the countries such as Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan. And this yeah, you're happen. right. I would. Yes, I agree. And I would argue that India is really the only country uh, that the U.S. looks at with a real sharp strategic lens. Pakistan, certainly, but mainly because of the connection to Afghanistan. Uh, and, and, and I mean, even Afghanistan, I mean, if, yeah, well, certainly China, China is a whole different story, but you know, it's interesting. The U S has an Indo-Pacific policy that the Trump administration came out with. It's a lot like Obama's, uh, Asia rebalance only it has a different name. Right. The idea right. is to deepen relations with the countries of the Indo-Pacific, which until recently were defined by Washington as the countries of East Asia and Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. However, what's interesting is the Trump administration has now come up with a new geographic conception of the Indo-Pacific, which now includes South Asia. I mean, you may, may remember, Frank, that uh, at the Ricina Dialogue, a major summit uh, in India happened in New Delhi earlier this year, uh, a top uh, uh, Trump administration official, Matt Pottinger, said that the Indo-Pacific now stretches from Kilimanjaro to California, which is a wow. change <laughs> from how- That's a long way. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it is a long way, but what's significant is that now encompasses all of the countries of South Asia. You know, the, the saying used to be that the U.S. looks at the Indo-Pacific stretching from Lollywood to Hollywood, uh, which is not quite the same. So what this means is that the, if the U.S. considers all of South Asia to be within the Indo-Pacific rubric, then that suggests, at least rhetorically, that the U.S. views every South, e South Asian country as a key component of the Indo-Pacific strategy, which according to recent documents from the U.S. government uh, indicate a desire to scale up uh, relations uh, on a variety of issues, not to counter terrorism, counter narcotics, cybersecurity, countering piracy. So potentially there's scope for all of the countries of South Asia to be included in this Indo-Pacific strategy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, we appreciated that very much. And, and thank you for watching our show. This is Frank Islam wishing you a great week.